Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jamie Rice for the Maine Historical Society. And I would like to start by recognizing that what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homeland, a place that Wabanaki people have stewarded for over 13,000 years. We at the Maine Historical Society also recognize the sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within the land and waters of Wabanaki homeland. And this acknowledgement is specifically relevant to today's topic on the Pajebscot proprietors, also known as the proprietors of the township of Brunswick. Uh, the, this collection at Maine Historical Society of colonial and federal era land speculation records is uh, specifically relevant to understanding the ongoing work between um, recognizing Wabanaki homelands and stewarding Maine Historical Society, Maine history in general. And we have ongoing work with represent representatives of the Wabanaki community, including Darren Ranko, who is on our presentation today about uh, authoring an authentic land and water acknowledgement that is um, relevant to the work as Maine Historical Society undertakes as the stewards of Maine history. And the Pajewskot Proprietors Collection is the most heavily consulted collection at Maine Historical Society. It's about three and a half linear feet um, in, in archival terms of manuscript material that has been at the Historical Society since the Civil War. And this material, along with the Kennebec proprietors and the Barclay collection, which is affectionately known as the Northeast Boundary Collection, is part of an any National Endowment for the Humanities project at Maine Historical called Mapping Maine, uh, Beyond Borders, Mapping Maine and the Northeast Boundary. Uh, this project it aims to uh, provide full text, free online access to these manuscript materials, which is, uh, invites a wide variety of audiences and scholars to research within these collections and help better contextualize the materials. Um, and, and this particular collection you know, speaks to the, um, the ongoing erasure and harm associated with the forced colonization, genocide, and violence, and while educating the public that these painful dynamics are vital to Maine Historical Society's role in contextualizing history. So this work um, is uh, especially exciting for us as an, in, as an institution to provide this kind of access to a collection that um, is frequently consulted, but yet has a great opportunities to further um, perpetuate uh, dialogue and conversations about um, the land and waters within what is currently uh, the state of Maine. Uh, if you're interested in uh, participating in the project, we have an exciting transcription initiative online through an online platform called Zooniverse, where you can sign up with a free account to help transcribe these materials and make them more accessible. Uh, lastly, I will point out that the Pajewskot Proprietors Collection, which is the topic of today, is closed to research at this time while we fully digitize the materials. But we have plans to launch the first portion of the um, Beyond Borders portal this winter, and the Pajewskot Proprietors is the first collection to go online. So if you're interested in the meantime, I would encourage you to participate in our Zooniverse project. Um, and before I turn it over to Ian, our host, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today uh, and the National Endowment for the Humanities for their continued support of our project and to the Williams family for their support of our annual Historians Forum. And then finally to Ian Saxine, our coordinator and host for uh, the MHS Historian Forum series. Uh, thanks very much and I'll turn it over to Ian. Thank you, Jamie. I'd like to thank uh, everybody in the audience for attending. Uh, thanks also are due to uh, Kathleen Newman, our manager of education and public programs, who is coordinating the tech side of this so ably. Uh, to Henry Chiazzo, uh, our digital and project archivist, who so helpfully uh, made a, a bunch of these images available. Uh, to myself and the panel for, for early looks and, and, and reading. Uh, 
uh, and then to all the, the donors and members of the, the Maine Historical Society who make this possible. If you're not a member yet of the Maine Historical Society, uh, hopefully this event will encourage you to become one. Uh, and then last but far from least, thanks are due to all of our panelists who I'm going to introduce to you now. Uh, just a quick, uh, a quick sort of uh, map ahead for, for everybody. So I'm gonna introduce the panelists and our, our topic of discussion. Uh, we're then, uh, the, uh, we are then going to segue into uh, discussing a series of document clusters. Uh, the most visually appealing or relevant are gonna be made visible to you. Uh, I have a, uh, I, I'm gonna share my screen with those uh, for, for the audience. There's gonna be a five minute intermission at the halfway point for people to stretch their legs. Uh, and then those of you with questions, we're going to get to those just a touch after 11 a.m. And the uh, most of the final hour of this program will be devoted to uh, responding to, uh, to comments and questions from the audience. And so uh, if you have a question right now, by all means, write it down. But we'll be, we'll be getting to it a little bit later in the program. All right, uh, so uh, this is a very, uh, I'm very excited to introduce this panel to all of you being introduced in alphabetical order uh, with no other uh, insinuations being made. Uh, Michael Blakeman is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University where he teaches courses on the American Revolution. Uh, and on the early American, uh, early Republic uh, borderlands. Uh, he's currently completing his first book, which I'm very uh, eagerly anticipating, uh, which examines the enthusiasm for investment in indigenous lands that swept the United States during its first quarter century. Uh, the title is Speculator Nation, sorry, Speculation Nation, Land Mania in the Revolutionary American Republic. It'll be coming out with University of Pennsylvania Press. So get those pre-orders in as soon as you can. Uh, next up, Sarah Damiano is the Assistant Professor of History at Texas State University, where she teaches early American and Atlantic world women's and gender history. Her first book out this year from Johns Hopkins University Press, which you should definitely check out, is to her credit, Women, Finance and the Law in 18th century New England cities. She has also published articles on wives and legal and financial competence in 18th century New England port cities, female estate administrators, and revolutionary, sorry, excuse me, revolutionary women's conceptions of marriage. I get so excited sometimes, I just, yeah, enunciation. All right, next up, Alexandra Montgomery is the postdoctoral fellow in digital history and cartography of the American Revolutionary War era at the Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. And she is the point person of the uh, American Revolutionary Geographies online portal project there, which will bring together over 4,000 maps from the half century after 1750 in a single online research portal, which you should uh, definitely check out. You can see her most recent publication, Debating Nova Scotia and Ideolo and Ideologies of Empire in the Era of American Revolution in the edited collection by Edinburgh University Press, Reappraisals of British Colonization in Atlantic Canada. Uh, and last but far from least, Darren Ranko, uh, who I'm only providing an abridged summary of his accomplishments, otherwise this would take up much of our morning. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of Anthropology and Coordinator of Native American Research at our own University of Maine. Uh, his work focuses on indigenous sovereignty, resource preservation, and environmental law in an era of increasingly disruptive climate change. Uh, his work has appeared in journals including Climactic Change, Sustainability Science, Journal of Forestry, and Human, uh, Human Ecology. He's a board member on the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor and a regular consultant at the Maine Historical Society, uh, including at the recent Holding Up the Sky exhibit on uh, uh, Wabanaki history and culture. His upcoming book, which I'm very much looking forward to, is Tribe at Risk, Identity, Knowledge, and Environmental Diplomacy on the Penobscot 
River. All right, which you should definitely be uh, eagerly anticipating as am I. So a warm welcome and thank you to all of our panelists. So uh, pretty soon our panelists are going to briefly uh, share the perspective they're bringing to this subject and collection. Uh, before they do that, I'm going to oh so quickly uh, tell you a little bit about uh, who the Pajepska proprietors were uh, and what this collection is that we are talking about today. So the Pajepska proprietors were a land company formed by eight men in 1714 to take advantage of a land claim in uh, what's now the mid Maine, uh, acquired from the which they acquired from the estate of Boston merchant Richard Wharton, who himself had purchased claims uh, from the heirs of an early trader named Thomas Purchase and also from a number of Wabanaki Sagamores in the 1680s. I'm going to share a couple of maps with you, with you folks as well. All righty. Okay, so this should be visible here. So I've got a couple maps here. So we have, uh, just so you know where we're dealing with, uh, we've got, I'll zoom in all the way. Oh, crying out loud. oh sorry. Uh, going to do it this way. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, very quickly here. So the Pajewska proprietors uh, who laid claim to parts of the present day state of Maine. Uh, and we can see that their, uh, their claim uh, is the dark area on the, at the bottom central portion of this map. Uh, all of these claims that the Pajepska proprietors and their rivals made, these should be taken with uh, like a whole barrel of salt in terms of uh, there was a lot of overlap and confusion. Many of these claims were uh, not exactly uh, verified uh, by both indigenous people and other, other rivals as well. Uh, but this should just give you a sense of the land that we're talking about, which includes the dark portion of this, uh, this map, as well as the towns of Brunswick and Topsha. Uh, so thanks to Bill Keegan, by the way, for making this map. Uh, okay, so that's the uh, that's what we're dealing with there. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share there. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so sorry, let me pull back up here. So okay, so the Pajewska proprietors uh, they they acquired this purchase after a period of warfare from 1688 to 1713. Uh, saw the Wabanakis push the English out of virtually all of what the English called the province of Maine, east of the town of Wells. Massachusetts formed a committee of Eastern claims with the intention of fostering a recolonization of, the, of what they called the Eastern frontier. And the Pajewska proprietors were one of several land companies that formed during this period, hoping to buy up or bully out all the rival claimants to the regions. Uh, the eight original owners each held a one eighth share, which they purchased for 140 pounds sterling, which was a significant chunk of, of money back then. Uh, their names were, uh, the, their names included members of some of the most prominent families in all of Massachusetts. Uh, all of these men uh, either lived in Boston or had connections in Boston. They were Oliver Noyes, John Wentworth, Thomas Hutchinson, Stephen Minot, Adam Winthrop, John Ruck, David Jeffries and John Watts. Uh, over the ensuing decades, these one-eighth shares were broken up to by the heirs and descendants and, and buyers into the company. And so you had people uh, like Belcher Noise of Boston who owned two-fifths of a one-eighth share uh, and other such confusingly uh, divided names. And this included a number of heirs, widows, uh, and other purchasers. Uh, so after this period of, uh, of war between the Wabanakis and their French allies and uh, the British Empire, uh, the Pajewska proprietors sought to uh, take a lead in recolonizing the, uh, the Wabanaki frontier and what became the state of Maine. Now the Pajewska proprietors had an easy time persuading 
uh, the Committee of Eastern claims uh, of their claims, since several of the members of the committee were themselves members of the company. And so there's some really kind of odd documents describing this publicity tour that the proprietors took uh, this, uh, this special committee of Massachusetts leaders on because uh, the committee was uh, itself uh, composed of proprietors. So they were basically talking to themselves. Um, and so uh, the uh, surprising almost no one, the company uh, received uh, a blessing of Massachusetts for its claims. In 1715, the Pajepska proprietors uh, commenced trying to, uh, to populate its planned towns of Brunswick and Topsham. They gave away 100 acre lots to the first 50 families who were willing to move to those two communities. Additional residents could buy lots of the same size for five pounds. Uh, the company uh, from the get-go struggled to attract willing colonists uh, to, this, to these places. One lot in Brunswick changed hands three times in two years. The company shipped in 160 Irish Protestants in 1718. In 1722, another war broke out with the Wabanakis in part uh, caused by Pajepskit proprietors making claims that the Wabanakis themselves did not buy about the extent of their lands. Uh, and the Wabanakis put Brunswick and some of the neighboring outposts to the torch, which they did not uh, believe had permission to be there. The Wabanakis in Massachusetts fought on and off until a negotiated treaty in 1727 that the Pajepska proprietors became convinced included a, an indigenous ratification of their title. The company then uh, presided over a slow and steady recolonization of Brunswick, which was incorporated in 1737, and Topsham finally incorporated in 1734. The original generation of the proprietors died out. Um, and then by the time that Belcher Noyes became clerk of the company in 1739, uh, he was a Bostonian and an heir of, of one of the, uh, the original proprietors. Uh, he, uh, Noyes himself seemed to be running much of the company's affairs himself uh, from day to day. Uh, many of these, the, the, the documents that the Maine Historical Society holds today could effectively be called the Belcher Noyes papers uh, because Noyes himself uh, wrote so many of these records and collated them and, and kept track of all of them. And so he really left his stamp on them. Uh, also, we should add that a huge chunk of the Pajepska proprietor's papers that the Maine Historical Society has deal with the township of Brunswick and the particular dealings of the proprietors of that town rather than the company writ large. The next couple decades uh, after the, the war in the 1720s, it was kind of a lull in company activities and in the documents until uh, Belcher Noyes himself kind of had to rouse his other shareholders into defending their claim against the new Kennebec proprietors, uh, a rival company in the early 1750s. A series of legal confrontations with them occurred alongside a renewal of fighting between the Wabanakis and Massachusetts, first uh, in the 1740s and then again decisively between 1755 and 1760. Uh, the Wabanakis occasionally uh, attacked the towns of Brunswick and Topsom, especially in the 1740s, uh, killing a few residents and destroying a good deal of, of, of buildings there. Uh, but the overall result of these conflicts, especially in the 1750s, uh, were, were much more damaging for the Wabanakis themselves who were the targets repeatedly of scalp bounties by the uh, by Massachusetts, successive Massachusetts governors um, and by attacks by uh, Massachusetts militia, uh, but then uh, wider on the sort of geopolitical front, uh, by the end of the 1750s, the, uh, the French empire ceded its claims to North America. The French had been the major military backers of the Wabanakis, allowing them to militarily resist Massachusetts imperialism. And so uh, the, uh, the final war in the 1750s, uh, most commonly known in English sources as, as the French and Indian War, uh, broke Wabanaki military power uh, for good by 1760. This inaugurated a new influx of colonists into Northern New England and the Maritimes in Canada and a number of founding of new towns. 
uh, in the 1770s, uh, the Pajewski proprietors and the proprietors and other companies were preoccupied by the lead up to the revolutionary crisis and the war of American independence. Speculators didn't really get going again in Maine until around 1790. The Pajewski proprietors continued to engage in litigation over the extent of their patent, especially the location of the what's known as the Great Falls on the Androscoggin River, meant to delineate the far northwestern boundary as outlined in the Wharton deed of 1684. Uh, Josiah Little, uh, the other major uh, creator of the uh, Pajewska papers that are held in the, the society's collections, became a primary agent of the company after the Revolutionary War, and furthermore, the longest surviving proprietor living until 1830 and donating many of the records to, uh, to librarians with the society in the mid 19th century. Uh, local residents threatened and beat up agents and surveyors trying to chart the company claims in the region, which many squatters didn't believe they owed anything for. Uh, the fighting often included uh, struggles over timber rights, which was a major source of wealth in the often marginal farmlands further up the Androscoggin River. Uh, much of the later documents in our records stem from this period of legal and sometimes physical disputes. Uh, these disputes also uh, heavily included indigenous testimony and arguments over uh, what indigenous participants had really signed away or really meant that they were, they were ceding to various agents. Uh, when an agent was killed in 1811, authorities soon sent in militia and frontier squatters were forced to take terms. The Pajewska proprietors dissolved after fully dividing up their claim in 1814. So uh, today's talk is going to be uh, broken up by sort of roughly chronological order, but also by topic. So uh, I should add that we are privileging in a certain sense, the perspective of the creation of the records, but that doesn't mean that we are uh, privileging the experiences or the humanity of the uh, proprietors themselves, or even necessarily in, in implying that they are protagonists per se, uh, but the, the logic of the collection uh, and the way it was created. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the sort of arc of uh, the creation of this record and what the company and its agents were trying to accomplish by acquiring various deeds, negotiating with various indigenous communities, uh, and then also with uh, groups of colonizers, which they tried to introduce into the region. Uh, I think unlike some other uh, histories that we see, uh, that we see of, of this era, uh, I want to emphasize that we're going to begin uh, as, as is appropriate with, with documents involving indigenous participants, but it's not like the, uh, the Wabanakis are going to be discussed in the beginning and then sort of move to the side because then, uh, then of course they supposedly went away as the arc of many textbooks or other things would have it. The Wabanakis remained active participants in these uh, disputes and conversations uh, until well after the dissolution of the Pajepska company itself. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to ask the, uh, the participant, our panelists to, uh, to speak very briefly about uh, the perspective they're bringing when they look at this collection, what they're interested in uh, and what, uh, what sort of uses your scholarship has for a collection like this. Uh, and I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order this time uh, to shake things up as a fellow uh, end of the alphabet person. And so we'll start with Darren Ranko, uh, and then we will work our way up the alphabet. Uh, Darren, would you, would you please start us off, please? Yeah, and this is where I tell you what I know about all this stuff and how to, <laughs> my perspective. Um, great, Ian, it's really great to be um, with you all this 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 morning, and um, I, I just you know you, you introduce you you introduce me and and um, you know just like my mother would with all my professional uh, uh, context uh, given, but I uh, you know as the non historian uh, and tribal citizen on the panel, I also feel like um, you know I'm I'm, I'm happy. To be included and participate, but uh, also keep in mind I'm not a historian. Um, and what I do have is a, with a PhD in, in, in anthropology and um, a law degree in environmental law from Vermont Law School. Um, my interest in um, particularly the 
the, the Dummer's Treaty uh, history uh, that you referenced uh, from 1727, um, this issue of sort of peace and, and um, um, Wabanaki engagements on this sort of critical part of the mid to, to late 18th century where the Pachevskot proprietors come into play, um, but also just, you know, how, um, you know, this leads to eventually uh, the, the, the creation of what are called the white Indians in Maine. So I, I, I'm very conscious that um, the interplay, the, the, the imaginings of Euro Europeans first and Euro-Americans later, um, um, along that, that they're, they're not in agreement uh, of how to, how to manage these things. And then for, for Wabanaki people, um, and, and, and Ian, your book does a really great job at sort of talking through the strategies that Wabanaki people are employing, um, basically strategies of containment and, and negotiation. And, you know, as Wabanaki people really resorting to our forms of diplomacy, um, uh, that have served us for hundreds, thousands of years uh, to, to kind of manage even this very, very difficult uh, arrival and, and proliferation of, of, of newcomers um, and colonizers. So I think this, this um, what I can add, you know, what, I, what I'm really excited about, and I don't know if you want me to talk about the deed as well, um, but what I'm really excited about is just um, being able to articulate what what we can know in terms of the, uh, the the Wabanaki sort of purview or perspective through these uh, documents, which are not it's these aren't the best set of documents that I've ever seen. You know, in terms of Wabanaki perspectives, there are others, and uh, and and you know, and there also exist at the Maine Historical Society. Um, but but I would say that um, you know the tensions that are defining sort of what I think of as you know, what becomes what becomes Maine as a kind of Yankee frontier. Uh, that's what I call it. I don't know if that even makes any sense, but um, that is it's trying to um, both work through frontier notions of the American state, but also in this very particular Bostonian influenced um, these proprietors themselves are bringing, you know, their culture of of uh, you know. I mean, I'll, you know, I love the musical Hamilton. So it's like, you know, what, what's going on there? It's a bunch of land speculators basically trying to form a country. Um, and that's what we have here. You know, and I think the fact that this is kind of, I don't know, from a colonizer point of view or land prospector point of view, if it's a failure or a success, it definitely advances, you know, the colonial uh, cause and leads to, I think, you know, I think there's a good arc of like, this this kind of um, speculation leading to the creation of the state of Maine, like having an influence there, uh, I think I think people can 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 make those connections. So uh, I guess that's what I'm bringing. Ian, did you want me to talk about the deed? Sorry. Oh uh, no, it's fine, Darren. We're gonna we'll get to the deed. No, yeah. no, no. This is strictly just yeah. your your particular interests and and focuses of a scholar. That's, that's great. That's what I thought. And you mentioning Dummer's Treaty, we'll, we'll get to that and I'll try and contain myself because that is, I am notorious as a Dummer's Treaty hobby horse and I do not wish to beat said horse in public here. Right. Um, and so I'll, you know, uh, right. So this is all, this is all great. And so I'm just gonna turn it over and we'll, we'll get to all these, these great things. And so I'll Thanks. turn it over to Alexandra. Thank you, Darren. Hi, uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me here. This is a really wonderful panel uh, that you put together, Ian, and I'm very, very excited and pleased to be here today. Um, so I, um, you know, I, I am a historian, I'm an early Americanist. My, my primary sort of chronological focus is I'm kind of a um, mid to late 18th century type person. So the Pajepscott proprietors, although I've certainly spent some time with them and I'm excited to spend more time with them uh, are sort of on the, the very beginning of the stories that I'm most uh, personally invested in, um, uh, which is to say that, uh, uh, which is to say nothing. That was a poor way to start that sentence. Moving on, geographically, uh, where I tend to spend most of my time is, um, you know, if this part of Maine is the Yankee frontier, I tend to look at a more of a greater Nova Scotia concept uh, that ends up involving Maine heavily, because when I say Greater Nova Scotia, what I really mean is basically everything east of the uh, Penobscot River, uh, uh, which is sort of belongs to a slightly different um, intellectual 
as, as understood by outsiders, by European outsiders, a slightly different intellectual unit of, of, of property. Um, but what I'm really interested in, in the perspective that I'm hoping to bring to the conversation today is the role that companies like this um, and really uh, kind of state, and what I think of as quasi-state actors, which I consider the Pajab Scott proprietors to be a quasi-state actor, um, the role that they have in encouraging, promoting, and really enabling uh, settler expansion and settler colonialism. Um, you know, I, I generally don't tend to believe that the kinds of really incredibly destructive, incredibly rapid settler expansion and settler appropriation of indigenous land would have been possible without things, institutions like the Pajepscot proprietors and uh, without, thing, without um, tacit or overt buy-in um, from colonial and state governments. So what, I, what I'm especially interested in in my own work is what I refer to as weaponized settlement. Um, and by that, um, I mean sort of folks in power. Uh, so, you know, be they the general court, be they uh, the board of trade in London who are interested in um, harnessing the power of settlers, reproducing settler bodies, sort of gobbling up indigenous land, which is a, a, a common thing uh, that we're all familiar with, trying to harness that to their own political and geopolitical ends. Um, and just more generally the forms that that takes of, of trying to, to bring attention to the ways in which it's, it's, I think that too much attention gets paid to individual settlers and the things that they're doing as opposed to the systems that are enabling them, um, including bodies like the Jeff Scott proprietors. So that's kind of the perspective that I'm trying to bring to this today. Great, thanks. Um, okay, Sarah, next up, if you could, uh, where, where are you coming at this from? Great, so good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you, especially to Ian and the Maine Historical Society for convening this really exciting panel. So I'm just gonna give you a few sentences of explanation of my scholarship and then um, a few points that this then leads me to be uh, especially excited about in, in this collection. So in my own work, I specialize in the interrelated histories of gender, economic life, and the law in colonial British North America and also the early United States. And so, as Ian mentioned, I um, recently published a book called To Her Credit, um, which examines women's centrality to these interrelated worlds of finance and law. And that book focuses specifically on 18th century Boston and Newport, which were New England's two largest port cities at the time. And in that, um, what I do is I excavate the workings of a core component of the financial system and um, personal credit and debt borrowing and lending between individuals. And by extension, I um, also look extensively at the courts and debt litigation, which was a very important arena for enforcing all of those obligations. And so in my book, I then, um, I make two arguments. So first I, argue that um, free white women, um, much more than we've recognized or given them credit for, were ubiquitous in every stage of financial transactions from constructing agreements to collecting debts to um, enforcing those obligations in, in courts of law. Um, and therefore they were acting in many ways um, similarly to white men with the kinds of powers and vulnerabilities specific to those roles. And then second, I argue that there's an important change over time in that um, beginning at mid-century and especially after the revolution, there were some interrelated cultural and legal processes, um, particularly processes of class formation um, that narrowed women's financial and legal authority. And so overall then, um, what I tend to do as a historian in my own work is, is question linear narratives that tend to chart uh, sort of steady uh, stepwise improvement over time for women and instead to emphasize a much more uneven and contingent trajectory. Okay, so what does this mean for how I view the Pajepscott proprietors papers? I think there are um, three things that I'm especially interested in and three categories of insights that I bring to this. So first is um, this collection, right? As the collection of a company is a um, largely a collection of um, mundane, prosaic financial and legal records. And that's what I work with quite a lot in my own work. Um, so I've looked at thousands of court cases and petitions and a lot of the sort of mundane financial documents embedded within those. And in doing so, I have developed um, and drawn on a variety of strategies for um, using those documents to excavate routine practices 
and the wide range of actors who engaged in those practices and the skills or competencies, we could say, associated with those practices. And I think doing that, and we'll see this in a lot of the documents today, doing that allows us to move beyond um, the kind of top level individuals whom these documents were authored to, to center and instead to see a much wider range of actors um, involved in their production and involved in uh, the historical processes we're talking about. Point number two is, of course, I um, am very interested in questions of women's authority and women's relationship to the law and how the law conditioned women's access to property and financial power. And I think as exemplified in this collection, the law absolutely conditioned and in some cases curtailed um, women's economic power, but also not ex as extensively as we might think. And this was particularly the case um, if we're talking about elite women and widows, some of whom are featured in, in the papers that we'll be talking about today. And um, relatedly on this point too of women's authority, um, when I view a collection like this, I tend to think about the importance of households and families as economic units. And so that means um, not just thinking about wives as embedded within patriarchal households, but also thinking about white men, men like the Pajepstadt proprietors as embedded within these family networks. And I think it's important to think about the collective resources and strategies of these families and households and the ways in which um, wealth and capital um, is flowing through these families via institutions such as marriage, um, in some cases via the female line as well. Uh, and then finally, as I hope was obvious um, from the brief summary of my book, um, I am a historian of New England and of Boston, and there's a very strong connection, of course, between the Pajepscott Pajep proprietors and, and Boston, and I think this is just one of many ways in which elite Bostonians um, built financial and commercial networks during this period and ways in which we can think about um, flows of capital during, um, we could say this early phase in the development of capitalism. So I'll leave it there. I'm really looking forward to talking with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I know that uh, everybody will be amazed to learn that elite Bostonians used to play an outsized role in Maine. Uh, clearly those days are, are long gone now, you know, yes. Thank you, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, uh, last but not least, if you could let us know where you're, uh, where, you're, where you're coming at this collection from and then we'll look at some of the documents. Sure, good morning everybody. And thanks so much to Ian and to Jamie and everyone at the Maine Historical Society for organizing this. I think it's a really creative and fun approach to a, to a panel. I'm psyched to sort of dig into some of these sources with everybody here. So as Ian said, I'm a, I'm a historian of revolutionary and early national America. So I come at this collection from a later perspective, um, a lot like Alla. Um, the book that Ian mentioned is a, a, a history of this mania for land speculation in the first quarter century of American independence, not just in Maine, but kind of across the territory that the United States claimed. Um, and the book focuses on relationships between large scale land speculators and the state in order to try and explore why and how the American Revolution um, fused speculative finance to settler colonialism in the early Republic. So what I'm interested in explaining is the creation of this sort of uh, model of US expansion in which Eastern financiers and lawyers and bankers and other capitalists, which was a word that many of them like actively embraced at the time, um, how, how that group of people were just as important to processes of dispossession and settlement as farmers and ranchers and soldiers and surveyors um, on the ground in these contested regions. So one of, the, one of the book's sort of major arguments is about how finance became a way, a kind of a, a set of tools for governments and individuals to draw revenue and to profit from territory that in many cases they didn't even control. Because during the period that I'm writing about, um, the 1780s and the 1790s, the United States was really kind of pitifully weak, not just on the world stage, but also vis-a-vis -vis, um, you know, neighboring indigenous nations and confederacies. So that kind of, um, the idea of finance and land speculation as a crutch in the service of future ambitions is, is something that I'm really interested in. So when I dive into a collection like the 
the Jeff Scott proprietor's papers, I'm looking for a couple different types of evidence. I'm, I'm trying to understand how, how speculators built relationships with various levels of state power, whether that's colony, state, nation, empire. Um, I'm looking to try and find out how they, how they understood land and how and why those understandings changed you know, as, as a place, as a property, of, a, of, as property, a, a legal right, um, as a commodity, as a, a repository or source of value, even kind of as a, um, an abstract means of exchange. So like the monetizing of land it is something that I, I write a lot about. Um, in the service of that, I'm also looking for, you know, how understandings about what land was informed the way that people tried to build claims to it. So that includes, and this is really where I think my, um, my, my background and my interests become relevant, most relevant to the discussion today, includes the ways that speculators tried to conceptualize and to regulate native land ownership or the idea of native title. Um, often doing so, as I said, from a position of sort of geopolitical weakness. And ultimately, I'm trying to understand how all these things kind of shaped speculators' political and financial and business strategies. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is I'm, I'm also just always kind of looking for the human stories in these collections, you know, to understand land speculators and the people they interacted with as people, their, their mentalities and their motives and their personalities. Um, and the, the things that made them tick. All right, thanks so much. Uh, and I'm realizing in the spirit of transparency, I should take like 30 seconds to say like where, uh, where I've come at these documents from uh, as, as, as the, the host here. And so my, uh, my scholarly interest in these documents started in 2009 um, and I, I've, been, I've spent you know, the past 10 years or so, really looking at uh, the ways, as, as Michael said, native title. And so the, the shifting uh, battle to interpret these so-called Indian deeds uh, on, the, on the main Wabanaki frontier uh, and between different groups of Wabanakis and frontier colonists and absentee speculators and how these agreements were not sort of one-off uh, affairs that were not relitigated, but were instead the subject of constant renegotiation and reinterpretation for oftentimes generations. Um, and my sort of chronological area of interest is actually the first sort of 50 years after the Pajapska proprietors were formed uh, and the ways in which accidentally uh, for companies like the Pajapska proprietors and many British would be uh, colonizers, uh, indigenous title became an essential a prop for their own ambitions. And so uh, to be clear, I'm not arguing that the British Empire or the Pajapska proprietors or anything were sort of quote unquote good uh, for indigenous people, but rather uh, that indigenous people were able to manipulate this system and had a place in it. Uh, and that that all changed really uh, around the time of the American Revolution. And that, you know, I would argue that the United States was far worse for most indigenous people in terms of as being a neighbor and in terms of its uh, the place of indigenous land rights in the US legal framework was way worse than the British Empire. And so my scholarship is basically, in a nutshell, how these different groups of indigenous people, among other things, made the British Empire uh, occasionally uh, not harm them or occasionally work for them, uh, albeit against its will. Um, all right. Uh, so, without further ado, we're gonna we're gonna jump into these uh, these documents. And so, uh, Kathleen Newman is going to be uh, is going to be projecting them. Uh, some people, it turns out, are not good at singing while playing guitar at the same time. I'm uh, I, I'm one of those. And so, um, uh, Kathleen, if we could look at our first uh, our first document to share. And actually, you can if you can show folks the uh, I guess the map first as well that I was uh, foolishly uh, that I was having a hard time. So scroll down one more on the map, if you would. Uh, thank you. So this is the map that uh, I was trying to show, but apparently was not. Uh, it was too small. So the Bajewska claim is the on the bottom left, the sort of dark uh, smudge on the screen there. Uh, that also includes the towns of Brunswick and Topsham. Uh, and then we have those stars are major 
uh, Wabanaki communities. Uh, these are approximate locations. Uh, and then uh, there's a few other rival company claims as well. Okay, and then if we can scroll one map down, um, this is uh, the, the main frontier uh, circa 1755. And that big dotted line is the, uh, the claim of the new Kennebec proprietors, uh, much larger. Uh, and of course, put next to the Pajewska and then some of these other rival claims for, um, for comparison. Okay. But so the, the first document we were going to look at is the, uh, is the Wharton deed. This is a detail of the 1684 Wharton deed. And so a note to our audience, the spirit of this talk is a little bit kind of like a cooking show envisioned where like these are the ingredients which our esteemed chefs are, are going, you know, all use for their different recipes. And so the idea was that people would be talking about what they think these documents, of course, what they say and what, what, what uh, you know, important questions surrounding them, but then also sort of what they, what they might use them for. And so for example, the Wharton deed might be useful for some legal scholars. It might also be useful uh, for, uh, for scholars about, uh, of indigenous land use uh, or of indigenous sovereignty, for example. Um, or if somebody who's interested in tracking uh, who in fact is the Sagamore of different Wabanaki communities at different places and times and so forth. All right, so uh, this, this document here is a highlight of the, what's known as the Wharton Deed of 1684, okay? Uh, and so just, uh, just very, uh, it, very quickly, uh, so Sarah is our uh, is uh, is our, our our foremost legal scholar here. Could you just uh, so that the audience is is clear on there a deed a land deed like this on uh, in, in English law? Um, what, was there anything different about uh, deeds in 1684 or something uh, the position of a deed like this in English or, or New England law that we should know about? Hmm. Okay. Um, so, so I think that, right, so as, Ian, as you were just saying, I think the important thing as a starting point to realize here um, is that we are operating within a um, English or ultimately British common law um, system. And so um, these, these deeds were really um, sort of in many ways formulaic or, or standard um, fill in the blank style documents. And so in fact, you could go to a handbook from this kind of, from this time period and it would give someone like a clerk or a lawyer who was seeking to draft one, um, a template of uh, what, um, what the opening line should be and then what you fill in in the middle and, and so on. And so um, key in, in land deeds, right, is the idea that the prior holder of the land is, um, voluntarily and freely um, transferring possession of that land to, um, to someone else. And so what's interesting about this document and hopefully what my um, co-panelists will pick up on is that this is not a transfer between um, two English colonists. It is a transfer um, from indigenous people to um, to English colonists. And so this idea of a free and voluntary transfer of land um, on which is sort of central to this notion of a land deed, um, I think is something that we have to think a little bit more critically about here. And the final thing I'll say about these kind of fill in the blank um, legal forms is that I think it's really important to think about them as collaboratively produced or as having multiple voices present in them. And so of course, um, an ordinary person at the time, um, even an English colonist, isn't going to be able to draft one of these um, sitting down, um, drafting it from scratch. And so instead, we have the voices of um, a clerk or someone skilled in the law combined with the voices of other people here, um, including, um, in this case, um, Wabanaki leaders, right? And um, hopefully, we'll talk more about those um, signatures down at the bottom, which I think are particularly um, fascinating and attest to their um, their role in that process. And so I think I'll stop there, Ian. Hopefully I covered um, what what you wanted and um, my co-panelists, hopefully I've set you up to, um, to elaborate. Absolutely, thanks. 
So if we could get uh, Darren uh, and, and Ala to jump in here uh, as well. So one of the, first of all, one of the questions that I think that you've probably gotten uh, as scholars uh, at various points, you get from audience and they'll say, well, um, how can I tell if this deed is a good deed? Uh, I'm sure you've heard this one. How do I, I know there were some bad ones people will say. So what are, how can I tell if this is a good deed or not? Um, and so uh, Darren, having looked at a number of these deeds, uh, could you uh, could you talk about, well, first of all, I know that that's like a very overly simplistic question and that that kind of a question is when you're going to say, oh, no, 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 let's unpack this. But so if when somebody asks you if this is a, a good deed or how do we know this is a, a consenting deed, uh, what are what is your response and what are some of the things that you look for when looking at a document like this? Yeah, um, I mean, they're all pretty bad. Uh, so that's the <laughs> that'll be my first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the most productive space, you know, and I guess to me, what is, you know, a good deed over, especially for this time period, this is probably not a very good deed. Um, you know, the earlier the deeds and, and treaties, um, you actually see a lot more Wabanaki um, or indigenous perspectives. Um, this one doesn't have that very, very much of that. Um, you know, and I'm very influenced by the work of um, like Rob Williams and, um, you know, th this idea that these, these are, these are attempts at, at capturing, as Sarah mentioned, kind of a legal pluralism, right, that there is this two different concepts of law, uh, property, uh, as such, land, probably a better uh, concept than property, um, kind of clashing together to kind of settle something, at least in the moment, uh, you know, and I think the ones that are really are, can articulate indigenous or Wabanaki um, perspectives often, you know, talk more, more directly about ongoing relationships that the Wabanaki people have with these places, with, with these lands. Um, we don't see that in this deed. Um, the, the, the treaties are, are better at capturing that in general at this time period probably than, than the deeds themselves. Um, but I think, you know, you do see this, uh, it, in this particular deed, you see this sort of ongoing use and benefit. Basically, <laughs> if you're reading this from a Wabanaki perspective, you know, nothing that's really important to you about land in terms of access, hunting, fishing, you know, none of that is curtailed. In fact, they affirm it and say, this should, this does not prevent you from accessing or using the, these lands in the way that you, you always have. Um, it just does a little bit of a carve out for English settlement. Um, um, so from a Wabanaki perspective, this is even, even though the framework is a kind of English deed uh, language, um, you can read this as a pretty, you know, not much is given up. And actually the sort of language about sort of totality of, I forget what they use, I tried to take some note, um, this like, like um, absolute language uh, that, that exists sort of towards uh, also in the second half of the, of the deed, um, probably wouldn't make a whole lot of sense from a Wabanaki perspective. Um, because these are always shifting and maintained over time uh, kinds of agreements. Ian, you've written about this. I mean, this whole point of having a deed, a written document doesn't, isn't as meaningful for Wabanaki people as it might be for the English in terms of these notions of absolute terms. Could I um, actually, Darren, yeah. could, could I ask you uh, if you could elaborate a bit? So uh, the Wabanakis, and, and so these were not Penobscots, these were, no. Uh, yep. These folks were uh, Amara Scoggin, most likely, mm -hmm. yep. uh, and so. But um, the, the fact that we're not entirely sure, of course, is, right? I mean, yes, we it's, don't trace these people very well. That are uh, yes, that are signing. Yeah, right. no, no. When I wrote about it, I was like, "This is the best I can do." Sorry, everybody. Like here, you know, you got to pick one. Otherwise, sometimes when you're writing about this period, you have this like two paragraph preamble of this is the best I can do. And this is what we think and da da da. So uh, people will say, well, so Wabanakis did not believe in property for profit, right? That's, but 
uh, they did talk saying that there's no such thing as indigenous property is also false in the basic sense of Wabanakis believe that communities had the right to limit access to various resources and goods. So could you please explain yeah. briefly what the what the shared across Wabanaki groups kind of pro, uh, idea of property that would be relevant to us here would be? Yeah, I mean, I'll give it a shot. The the, I mean, some of this is, um, as you mentioned, that the, the 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 investment in use and access um, are the English concepts, but it's better in a Wabanaki perspective to think about this as being in relationship to um, land and resources, right? Mm -hmm. So as well as with other people and your ancestor, you know, like the relationships don't end with, with mere um, things or, or, or either or, or, or uh, peopling, right? So I think the, the notion that, um, um, yeah, for hundreds, thousands of years, Wabanaki people had, had, had developed a, a, a whole set of diplom diplomacies um, based in wampum, um, which basically were about these disputes, among other things, or about organizing uh, access in, uh, uh, to, to lands and resources that um, uh, were about you know, limiting and recognizing other people's roles and responsibilities uh, of, to different places, right? So I think that's the framework that Wabanakis are bringing to this is um, um, uh, Wabanaki people are already used to kind of working with, you know, if not the English, you know, at this point, mm -hmm. uh, although they've been around for a while, um, or the French, uh, working with other Wabanaki or, or other uh, indigenous groups to kind of formulate these kinds of agreements around who has who has more direct access to certain places and 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 you know maintaining that relationship to each other so so um, um, you know disputes are 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 not proliferated like that we know where each other sort of has a role and responsibility on this landscape um, and so I think that's probably my best um, you know. For, for Wabanaki people, our first sort of treaties like this, our first set of relationships are with non-humans, right? So they're with the animals first, right? So we have these, you know, kind of transformer tales and they're kind of treaties related to that. And then we move out from there um, to uh, other other places and, and peoples um, across across the, the Dawnland. So I think, yeah, just that entry point of like, so there's nothing new about Wabanaki people meeting with some other group of people sorting out like who who's going to go where who has access to go where it's what what is um quite sort of difficult to comprehend from a wabanaki perspective although i think by the 18th century um you can you could uh you know with people like loran recognizing that when the english put in these terms of like absolutism that they're they're saying something that that we that we as wabanaki people are like that we should be super suspicious of. Um, and so, and of course with Dummer's Treaty, this is pretty clear that they hide that language from him in particular as, yeah. and then it's in the treaty and then he has the translation of it go, anyway, there's a whole yeah. story there, as you know. Oh you. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, but, but I think, you know, that's, um, I think that entry point, you know, here of, of you know, um, land as a resource and as a, a point of access where different people have different control, that's totally consistent with Wabanaki perspectives. It's this sort of absolute terms of, that you find in property law, which Sarah talked about, that the English in particular bringing with them, which is still being kind of organized, right, in the, in the 17th century in terms of English common law um, itself. Like, you know, is it, you know, grant by a sovereign? Can people buy and sell it themselves you know these are still kind of um terms of uh, fluidity i think in in the 17th century for the english as well so i think this shifting kind of legal pluralism um can can make things confusing right in terms of people understanding exactly what they're agreeing to yeah uh and i i'm, I'm glad you bring this up and then we'll get to to alexandra and weaponized settlement and using this as well because i think you segue but uh, yeah it's important to point out that in massachusetts they weren't 100 percent clear on what their hierarchy of claims of title were whether it was from the king or indigenous deeds or whatever and they purposefully and this is something that i argue 
Um, and, but that uh, you can argue that a lot of Massachusetts elites purposely kept it vague because the system they wanted to build in the early 18th century was illegal according to the crown, but being good uh, Massachusetts colonists, they did it anyway. And so how did they do, they kept this sort of under the table uh, hodgepodge legal system going which they were living, the Pajewska proprietors and their rivals were fighting in part because they were dealing with a system that uh, had a lot of stuff that was unwritten law and it was just commonly understood. And these people would say, well, it's the practice here that we treat this kind of property this way. Um, and so speaking of, we should also add 1684, the Wharton deed is one of the last deeds uh, that exists for this for the the future state of Maine uh, that the Wabanakis ever agreed they did in fact sign. Uh, it's the last one one of the last ones that was ever actually acknowledged. There's one the Penobscots. There was a swindle in 1693 that isn't really a real deed. But after the war, the, the Wabanakis after 1688, as Darren points out, they knew what it meant to sign these deeds, so they didn't do it anymore. Um, and so one of the interesting features of this document is actually how late it is, that they, very few of them even exist after the first war in 1675 to 1678. Um, uh, uh, Alexander, if you could talk a bit about, um, so uh, using deeds like this, uh, and you work, I know that your, your work is, is, is above all with uh, Mi'kmaq folks and like uh, and evidence from the Maritimes, but when you look at signatures uh, like this, what can deeds like this tell you about, for example, um, indigenous leadership or, tra or using these, these problematic documents as evidence to actually do Native American history? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, um, well, actually, first of all, I just want to take this brief opportunity to push back strongly against your earlier point that the British Empire was better for indigenous people than the American state was because I, I especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, derivation of title, um, you know, the reason Massachusetts was sneaking around is because, I mean, as consistent as the British Empire was in anything, which is to say not very, they were pretty like suspicious of the whole idea of Indian title from the beginning. Um, which has very disastrous consequences for indigenous folks in, in Nova Scotia, uh, where the concept of Indian title is never entertained. Um, but anyway, back to this, to, to looking at this deed and questions about what we can do. I mean, I, I would strongly co-sign you know, everything that Darren said, and I, I, I defer to him in this, that I think that the best way to look at these um, and the best way to understand you know, why they stop is that these early deeds are you know, this moment of possible pluralism where you have two sides coming together, trying to um, encode uh, systems of understanding about what land is and what it's for and how you access it that are um, not strictly incompatible, uh, at least on a very surface level. You know, uh, like Darren said, there's nothing strange to either of these two groups of folks about getting together and, and figuring out who's allowed to do what on what land. Um, it's the point where um, it becomes clear to Wabanaki folks that these are not an enshrinement in a sort of an ongoing uh, relationship um, and an ongoing sort of reciprocal set of responsibilities that can be negotiated and renegotiated as things change over time, um, but are in fact being interpreted as, as sort of an absolute in a way that's very foreign to my understanding to, to Wabanaki conceptions of how you use land, uh, that they're like, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, you know, and they and they and you see a completely different relationship between um, Wabanaki folks, and um, I think you see this analogous things in other indigenous locations, but certainly within Wabanaki folks, uh, a completely different relationship when it comes to negotiating with, with particularly English colonists about land. Um, oh, could I also ask uh, in relation to, so the Wabanaki stopped uh, signing deeds because they sort of knew what they did. And you you write about weaponized settlements. So what is it about living, uh, why isn't it that the English uh, and other British colonists and Wabanakis can't just live nearby each other and the Wabanakis can still farm their fields and hunt and fish and what have you and then the British can't just like farm and raise cattle and whatnot. Why is it that the British colonists don't make good neighbors in the long term? I said of the British colonists themselves why they can't just get it together. Um, <laughs> yeah well I think and this is where um, this is part of the reason why I in my work place such emphasis on sort of the larger than subtler unit 
Um, Because I think that there's a possibility for individual European settlers, even small European settler communities, to have a relationship with indigenous people that is not necessarily fully destructive. Um, That you can you can have you can be decent neighbors, people can have access to land. I think that that possibility exists. Um, What happens to me is that uh, the creation of these larger than settler units um, creates a situation which makes that kind of impossible, you know. Um, so on, on a very largely writ understanding, sort of the most sort of purest examples of, of weaponized settlement that, that I can give, and then I'll sort of work down to why it's relevant to this uh, topic is, is um, you know, in Nova Scotia, uh, where uh, the British apparatus uh, sort of wholesale refuses to consider the possibility of indigenous sovereignty and indigenous land rights, um, sort of in contravention of their own stated opinions elsewhere. Um, and uh, and they, they see that, that the best way to, um, so, so they, they, on the one hand, don't believe uh, that there's anything such as, such as an indigenous title. And they also would like to have stronger control over the region of Nova Scotia. And so their solution to that is to import as many, um, you know, Protestant reproducing family unit settlers as possible and stick them in the middle of Mi'kma'ki. Um, and so by their presence, they're going to kind of drive out indigenous peoples. Um, and they're able to do that because they have this, they have a, they have a larger perspective. They have a larger system in place in a way that an individual settler could never do that. An individual settler could be deeply prejudiced against indigenous people and want them to be gone, but they don't have the kind of like financial, legal, uh, governmental apparatus behind them that allows that to happen. And I see the Pajepska proprietors as sort of allowing that on a smaller level. You know, they're not a government, but they are sort of intimately tied into. Uh, the Massachusetts government, even where there's debates, even where there's disagreements, um, they have that larger backing that makes the presence of those settlers uh, much stronger and much more destructive than they could ever be on their own individual. um, Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, And I think, you know, there are two other kind of frames. One, of course, is the, you know, you know, uh, the doctrine of discovery, the Mm -hmm. uh, relative, um, originally a religious, hierarchy and then a racialized one um so racism white supremacy um you know seeing you know your neighbors as lesser than (laughs) and then not them not really having property like you have property um usually doesn't make for a good neighbor uh you know in terms of them thinking that you're lesser than uh although i would say i agree you know like there are so many um um there's so many you know documented, you know, settlements for 20, 30 years that are, you know, there's a kind of coexistence, but it, but it is at the end of the day, I think, you know, the, the, the speculators themselves, as, as, as Ella just mentioned, you know, <clears throat> where they encourage people to go, or, right, where they want, you know, like, there is a very purposeful sense that um, profit needs to be made <laughs> again and again and again. Um, off of other people's land. I mean, basically, that's what what that's the that's the imperative a replacement, right? Um, it, it's it's extraction first, and then you make way for the farmers, and they and they, you know, it's just it's the manifest destiny. It's the it's the hierarchies that are really um, framing up why are the English and then the Americans. I, I also I think I, I'm with Al here. I don't, I don't know about the British versus the American. I mean, you know. I just I think know. the British are, they're less competent. It's not about, it's uh, not about them having higher uh, aspirations. I'm not trying to, this is not a defense of the British imperial vision. Uh, I think that they suck differently is kind of where I've come down okay. on this okay. issue. Yeah, that's, that's they have right. a different set of possibilities and opportunities for indigenous people. And I, but I think, I do think that the British vision can be like destructive in, in a very, yeah. intense way well, i we, think i think the things that i mean i think that we what we associate with the american state in terms of that that drive for manifest destiny looks different perhaps than the british colonial framework but um well and michael know, can they, no they doubt weigh in <laughs> yeah right michael can no doubt weigh in because also there's the changing <laughs> legal framework right the the macintosh oh. decision and others but just one uh, aside for talking about individual coexistence, it's true, uh, but we should also note that like the, the English colonizers are just not as good environmental stewards in terms of sustainability 
So like, you know, the Wabanakis themselves were, were saying, hey, uh, when the English move into an area, their cattle overgraze and chase off the deer, uh, the, they overfish. And so then we can't, you know, and they, uh, they dam up the river and we can't fish. And so there's certain kinds of English land use practices that make it the land less useful for the Wabanakis. So the, the Wabanakis are still allowed to hunt in Brunswick theoretically, but like they're saying it doesn't matter because Brunswick's useless to us. Um, so Michael, if you could chime in here about, so the, the place of sort of Indian, indigenous land titles, um, uh, indigenous land titles in the American legal system after the revolution uh, underwent a, a real change in the 19th century. And so could you, uh, would you mind uh, giving us sort of key, uh, key differences or points uh, in, the, uh, in the American sort of uh, legal perspective of indigenous title that would have been different uh, than, than sort of earlier rulings? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the strategy of building land claims out of deeds like this, out of so-called Indian deeds or claims to Indian title is really important throughout most of the British colonial period and a lot of the different British colonies until this kind of set of reforms in the, uh, in the, in the middle of the 1760s, just after the Seven Years' War, when the British Empire is it's heavily indebted, it's trying to figure out how to govern this like vast new expanse of all the acquisitions that it got around the globe from uh, the defeat of the French. Um, it comes with all these like really troubling budgetary issues about how to pay down all the debt that they had, that they had incurred in trying to fight the war and defeat the French. Um, and so one of the Kind of main thrusts of the reforms that come out of the Seven Years' War is that the British Empire is going to try and constrain colonial expansion. They're going to try and start actually sort of setting limits on the colony's ability to expand their, their societies into new regions, into indigenous regions, through instruments like this, through, through Indian deeds. Because from the perspective of British imperial administrators, this kind of stuff, these like private shady deals that are worked out on the ground between, you know, people like Thomas Purchase or, or, or Wharton um, and, uh, and Native communities and Native leaders, they just become a recipe for conflict. And that conflict breeds violence and that violence generates costs that the British Empire is then going to have to pay. And it decides in the 1760s, you know what we can't. So uh, in 1763, there's this, you know, in, kind of the intensification of British imperial attempts to stop private land deeds like this. And to say instead, um, the British empire is going to be the sole source of title for colonists in British North America. So imperial officials like Indian superintendents, they're gonna be the ones responsible for, for acquiring indigenous territory. That title, native, native title, as they're conceptualizing it, is going to be kind of routed through the imperial state, and then the state will convey it to uh, the empire, the colonies will convey it to, to individual European colonists and landowners. This makes a lot of people pretty angry. It makes a lot of land speculators, um, you know, the Pajetska proprietors have their deeds, but people who are trying to acquire new land in different regions, such as the Ohio Valley, um, it, it, it makes them pretty angry because it seems to, it seems that all of a sudden here comes the imperial state kind of intruding on their ability to, uh, to, 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 to make a profit and to, to pursue their ambitions. This ultimately kind of feeds into the logic of independence. You see sort of traces of it in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then what happens after the American Revolution, after independence is won, is actually really surprising on this front because you'd think, okay, the American revolutionaries, they win independence. So they're just gonna go back to buying private Indian deeds, right? They're gonna go back to this sort of system as they enjoyed it before the 1760s. But that's actually not what happens. Instead, revolutionary leaders, both at the state and especially at the national levels, decide that they're actually gonna like retain those British imperial reforms. They're gonna retain those prohibitions 
on private acquisition of indigenous title for a really important reason, which is that they decide, revolutionary leaders decide that native lands are going to become a source of revenue for the state. You know, this is a, 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 a nation that's founded in tax revolt pretty much. So uh, a lot of the patriot leaders are like, well, we can't really raise taxes too much. We gotta find some other way to pay down the debt that we incurred in fighting the war for independence and to pay all the soldiers and to fund the new governments that, um, that are suddenly independent. And they, they, they identify native land sales, the, the, the acquisition and sale of native land as an important source of government revenue. So native title remains important, but there's sort of this trend towards concentrating the ability to acquire it, the exclusive ability to acquire it in the, in the state. And that carries through from the 1760s into the new republic. Great, thanks. Um, and my last question uh, before our, our brief intermission. So uh, Michael is also, by my understanding was that by the, the 1820s in particular in the, uh, the US, uh, indigenous uh, deeds were, it, Native Americans were considered to not have sort of group property rights, uh, but instead just sort of preemptory rights where it's kind of like rights of occupancy but not really property. Um, and uh, scholars kind of disagree, like how drastic or bad of a change this was, uh, right? But could you, in, in sort of layman's terms, could you explain what that difference is uh, for, for the audience to say that like when the Supreme Court ruled that Native Americans don't have property or title, but they just have preemptory rights? Yeah, so this, this, is, this is kind of a tough thing to try and explain um, off the cuff in layman's terms, but I'll give it, I'll give it a go. So uh, what Ian's referring to is a set of Supreme Court decisions that come basically out of, um, you know, the, the Georgia's attempt to expand into Cherokee land and the era of Jacksonian removal. And one of the things those court decisions establish is, as he said, that sort of uh, indigenous people do not own land in the way that, that uh, that US citizens, that Americans do. Um, if you read those decisions, they kind of say, like um, John Marshall will write some of those decisions, like this is the way, this is, we've always thought this. We're just kind of making it a matter of, of uh, you know, Supreme Court case law at this point, but that's actually not true. That's, that's fake history. Um, instead, what had happened in the 18th century and extending into the New Republic after the American Revolution um, was an, a, a sort of acknowledgement that indigenous people had land rights and that those land rights needed to be purchased. But it's always kind of hazy. There's a, there, it, there are these questions of like, what is that land right? Is it a right of occupancy? Is it ownership in fee simple? What, the, you know, what, that there's never any like solid consensus on the nature of indigenous land rights, but there is, especially in the first couple decades of the early Republic, a clear acknowledgement that those rights exist and that they need to be acquired through treaty or purchase. Now those treaties and purchases are more often fraudulent or coercive than not. Um, I'm, I'm talking about basically how Americans justify their own you know, uh, strategies to acquire indigenous land. So there's sort of this interlude, I guess, this messy interlude before the clear jurisprudence of the 1820s, um, gotcha. where you have messy and kind of competing conceptions of what native land rights are. Just, just to add to that, um, Michael, the, the uh, I, I think the hard thing to wrap your head around, because this is pretty much the practice in the American, although, as you mentioned, it's being sorted out. Um, just going back to the doctrine of discovery, the, the formulation is, is simply one that because they're not Christian originally, and then because they're not European or Euro-American, indigenous people actually cannot, there's, there's culturally an impossibility. They don't improve the land or they don't, they don't behave right, or they're just lesser than. They can't actually own property in, to in toto. But because of the do Doctrine of Discovery, which was also a way of, you know, minimizing, of course, it doesn't eliminate it, uh, an attempt to minimize, uh, you know, resource rushes by 
each European nation against one another, um, they basically say the Christian nation can get there, negotiate a, a access for the, the pro property uh, right, um, which um, once there is a treaty or a relationship, they can get that. And then the Europeans can, can be the ones that own absolute property. So it's just like, it, it, it is confusing because you have to sort of say like, you're, you're getting something from an indigenous title holder that they actually don't, they can't do themselves. Um, but you can because you're white or Christian or European um, and then you have the absolute, and then there are all these sort of formulations of like, oh, if there's a claim made and then, you know, uh, two hundred miles away, like the you know the French do their claim with a different tribe. Then they're like, well, halfway between is where they're going to meet, and you know there's there are all these different formulations that are never quite um, uh, <laughs> quite settled in terms of the application side of the doctrine of discovery. But and that's part of the sorting is is those areas not so much where you know um, you know there's a treaty with this group by this. European nation, um, but it's more like, to what extent does that go in terms of the claim that the European nation has? And then, then um, you know, these, when it's unclear, you know, they're a bunch of land speculators. So they're gonna try to sell it again or buy it again, you know, and then that's why you have all these sort of sorting of trying to centralize it, um, you know, with, with the creation of, and, you know, with the, with the US constitution and, um, uh, the the non intercourse act and all this other stuff to make sure and then the the Johnson v McIntosh decision which basically says anything that was done by a land speculator <laughs> um, that wasn't ratified or certified by the federal now the federal government is is going to be lesser than it's it so it has to be organized through this way so so I think you know and that gives you know there's a whole series of other things that you know with with Jackson and in and, and sort of that move you know um, his intensity around removal and that sort of thing as well. But, but I think, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to understand, I think simply for that, that the European or, um, nation has to get this thing, uh, an agreement that in essence gives the European nation an ability to own the property, but it never extends it to indigenous people. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take a very, brief intermission. Um, so for people who need a leg stretch, etc. Uh, we will reconvene at 11am on the dot to begin our, our thrilling final hour of this of this discussion. Um, so uh, don't, uh, don't go far. We will, uh, we will see you guys in five minutes. Thank you all. All right, welcome back, all. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take a big chronological and topical leap, uh, and uh, to uh, to bring in uh, to bring in we're gonna talk a bit about uh, the uh, the colonists who took up residence on the on the Pajepskut claim. Uh, and then some of the, the interactions they had. And this is uh, mostly viewed through the perspective of the Pajepska proprietors, prolific um, and at least to me, endlessly entertaining clerk, Belcher Noise. Um, and so uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start. Uh, Sarah has, uh, has encountered Belcher Noise extensively in her own work, as, as have I. Uh, you can find papers of his at the American Antiquarian Society, at the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, at the, uh, in the, uh, the Essex collections in Salem. Um, then of course, above all here, 
at the Maine Historical Society, your number one first stop for all Belcher noise related uh, pursuits. Um, so Sarah, first of all, so uh, Belcher Noyes was a, he, he lived in Boston uh, and he was a clerk of the Pajepska proprietors, which sounds rather humble, uh, but might be deceiving. Uh, and he, and he also of course was a, a key player in this network of, of Boston speculators, uh, which included a bunch of different companies. And so, first of all, uh, could you tell us a little bit about who Belcher Noyes was, uh, and then also talk a bit about this network of Boston speculators uh, that he was interacting with, uh, which includes both, you know, wealthy and sometimes not wealthy men as well as women in Boston. So, could you talk a bit about uh, who Belcher Noyes was, and then who these kind of investors were? Sure. Thank you. So, um, so Belcher Noyes uh, was part, as you said, of, of this family of, of Bostonians. He was related and um, he was the nephew of um, Jonathan Belcher, a governor of Massachusetts. Um, he spent much of his upbringing um, with Jonathan Belcher. And so he becomes um, the clerk of the Pajepscott proprietors um, in, I believe, 1739. And I think he's important to this story and important to um, representative, we could say, of a broader trend, which is um, how these sort of mid-level functionaries um, who, yes, have very elite connections, but also, right, he's not a governor, he's not um, a um, top merchant in Boston, um, and yet by virtue of this position as clerk, he has quite a bit of um, discretionary power, and he's the one doing much of that day-to-day -day, um, management work and also generating many of the records that, um, that we see. And so um, what's interesting about um, Belcher Noise, in which I've encountered as well, um, is he does have a kind of distinctive personality that emerges through the records. And I think there's a tie in here with Michael's interest in kind of the humanness of, um, of this period's history. Um, so I encountered Belcher Noise um, in my own research on a woman named um, Martha Stoddard Stevens, who's a wealthy Boston widow. And when her husband dies, um, she becomes the sole owner of a very sizable amount of land um, in Ashford, Connecticut in the um, 1770s. And by this point, Belcher Noyes is sort of um, entering old age. He's in his 70s, and yet he is um, helping her out managing these lands. And so there are many letters written by um, Martha Stevens, ostensibly, but actually um, by Belcher Noyes. And Ian, I know, has described Belcher Noyes as um, things like harried and um, perpetually self-pitying. And this same tone is in many of the letters that, that I've read. And so there's a um, kind of um, tendency towards hyperbole sometimes in the way in which he is writing about um, the various issues that he's facing. But right on the ground, he, um, in the case of the Pajepscott proprietors, is one of the ones who is really fundamentally grappling with these issues of um, Wabanaki land rights, relations between um, settlers and, and the Wabanaki. And I think too that it's important to note here um, as we think about um, the relative involvement of men and women in something like the Pajepscott proprietors, um, that as these shares were subdivided, right, there were both men and women who held shares in, um, in the company, uh, in, including um, on the female side widows, um, often as a result of, of inheritance. And so there were some widows who held um, roughly the same amount of property as, as Belcher Noyes, or even um, a larger share. And yet, um, old, owning a share is not the same as participating in day-to-day -day government um, governing decisions. And so we know some of those female shareholders didn't necessarily attend meetings um, and participate in the process in the same way. And so um, Belcher Noyes in contrast is really a, um, a figure who's impossible to ignore as one works with these collections. So Sarah, if I could ask, uh, and then we'll get to uh, part of his correspondence with the residents of Thompson. But uh, so Belcher and always loved to talk about how like, oh, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Oh, the cares. And he has this great 
I, uh, Jamie might have been there that day. I read this exchange between him and Enoch Freeman uh, in, the, in the library one day and I started laughing so hard I started to cry and like people were wondering what was going on and I was reading Belcher and, and Enoch Freeman. But Belcher, you know, he was always, oh, nobody understands me. You don't understand all the cares that I have. I'm doing this myself. What did the clerk of a company like the Pajewska proprietors do? Like what was, uh, what, what kind of responsibilities did this position entail? Like, cause he's more than just like their secretary at this point, right? Uh, in many cases anyway, a clerk of a company, like what, what were their responsibilities? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start and perhaps you can um, fill in the blanks here as, as well. But, um, so of course he's generating many of the records, but um, the activities that are leading him to generate those records are a lot of the um, day-to-day -day on the ground work, um, right? Collecting money and making sure people are um, obeying property divisions, right? Problems of um, squatters and resource usage, um, all, of, all of those kinds of things, right? The day-to-day the -day work of managing the company. Um, and, and what's interesting um, too is by the time he's helping out that Boston widow that I mentioned, the two of them have um, employed two men in Connecticut to essentially be those on the ground agents um, so that they can be in Boston not dealing with the messiness of it. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of funny role reversal and yet still this um, desperate harried tone of, of Belcher Noise and Martha Stevens of um, you can't possibly quit these positions. We desperately need your help. Um, you can't possibly understand how hard this is, et, et cetera. Great, thanks. And so there's a, a particular exchange. And so uh, Kathleen, if you could show us a uh, document, uh, uh, slide 17, uh, which is so Belcher Noyes uh, uh, under, underwent a, a, a long drawn out feud with a number of leading residents, particularly at Thompson, uh, which was the smaller and sort of uh, less, less populated uh, one of the, the two major company towns. And uh, Belcher Noyes spent over a decade trying to get the residents there to pay for all the lots that they occupied um, and to, uh, and, and, and these people consistently complained that they, um, that they were not on the best land uh, or that the land that they actually occupied wasn't enough to make a living and so on and so forth. And so on, uh, we have in the, in the holdings, one of the documents, uh, which is slide 17. So that should be uh, the one that's Thomas Wilson, who is one of these, these head, um, one of the more prominent uh, on the ground settlers in Topsom wrote to uh, Belcher Noyes uh, and he wrote a letter and had a bunch of his friends and neighbors sign it. So it's a few more down, it's, uh, it's two past the, the, the one with the, the divided up lots, uh, Kathleen, it's okay. So it's um, one more, one more, and then one more after that. Uh, yep, one more, there we go, it's this one, okay. Um, and so uh, this is the, the original of this letter. And so in it, uh, we have here the uh, Wilson and his colleagues says that as we are settled here, we think it proper to let you know that, uh, sorry, the, uh, when the first settlers here, we had been given five acres of meadow land. Uh, they're complaining about uh, the, the quality of the, of the, the land that they've been given. Uh, and it closes here. It says here that, um, ah, yes, we have the possession uh, and we have it fenced and are uh, willing, we're, we're ready to defend it. Um, uh, and it says, we have, uh, we, refu we shall refuse to, reply, uh, to comply with your proposals. Uh, I believe he says here, uh, since we are, uh, we are styled rebellious. Uh, and so we are prepared to, prepared to resist. Um, and then they, they, they sign all of this. And so this document was, is a, a relatively unusual uh, exposition of the perspective of, the, of a number of the on the ground colonizers who many of them were illiterate. Uh, 
uh, and we usually don't have the, the sort of more drawn out uh, arguments from their perspective on why they think they have a right to be where they are, even if they don't pay the uh, companies like the Pajepska proprietors. And so this exchange with Thomas Wilson uh, is part of a broader one that really lays out this, this theory of, uh, of land holding. And so I know that uh, Ella and Michael have both, uh, have both uh, spoken and, and written about this in the past. And Alan Taylor is probably uh, one of the scholars best known for articulating this. Um, so to begin with, I'll ask uh, if, uh, if Ala could maybe start with uh, their perspective and then maybe Michael can fill in how this, how this plays out at the sort of broader level, especially after the revolution. But so if, uh, according to a lot of these frontier colonists who didn't necessarily pay for their lands, Ala, why did they think they had a right to be where they were? Could you? Uh, well, to sort of answer this in a circuitous way, um, whenever I read, uh, you know, especially clerk's records for any land company like this, I'm reminded of the clerk's line where it's like this would be a great job except for the customers, uh, where, you know, land speculation would be a great <laughs> money making gig if not for the settlers. Um, because it's just, it's a constant headache. Um, you know, it, settlers never, ever, ever, ever do anything that proprietors want them to be doing. Um, they're never paying for land, they leave, they sort of quasi legally transfer their land to some other person and don't leave any record about it. Um, you know, they, they do not behave in the ways uh, that uh, the, the, the proprietors or the speculators or the company or whoever it is that, that sort of recruited them to be there want them to be doing. Um, you know, and honestly, I, I, I defer more to you, Ian, about um, the sort of on the ground um, settler theories of uh, land title. Um, but certainly um, from my experience, it tends to be more based on the, um, I have a right to be here because I'm the one working it. Um, I have a right to be here uh, to have this land because you know I, because I made the decision to move to the middle of Wabanaki country, I've had to defend it against Wabanaki people who are upset about the fact that I'm living in the middle of Wabanaki country. Um, and that sort of a thing. So it's, it's, it's an argument about uh, right to be there and right to property based on um, working the land and on defending the land, quote unquote, defending the land. Um, but yeah, certainly I always, um, I, I, the thing that always, that always drives me is like, I often get the question, you know, when I give presentations on this topic, um, you know, why, why did land speculators and land companies keep doing these things? And I honestly don't know because it doesn't seem terribly profitable and it doesn't seem, um, like it's just it's a constant headache <laughs> right it's a good point there's always there's the promise of the payoff and we should say there's the promise these... of the payoff and it's, it's also part of why i've gone sort of looking for um explanations for the behavior of these people um on, on the part of the proprietors that goes beyond a pure sort of profit motive um, i think this does change after the revolution um but certainly before the revolution um it's really not clear to me that this is something that's like this is Belcher noise is like, I'm going to do this because, you know, uh, anybody's going to be making money hand over fist doing this. I think it's a much more complicated set of motivations on the part of these proprietors. Yes, yes. Uh, and noise thought of himself as, you know, this benevolent civilizer who was mm -hmm. bringing. Which is part of it. Yeah, that's, yes. I, th I think that the, I think we need to take seriously um, some of the language that's easy to dismiss um, about, you know, we're doing this because we're, you know, bringing civilization to the frontier because we're creating a strong barrier to the X, Y, Z. Um, and I think we do need to take some of that language more seriously as, as a motivating factor, or at least as a persisting factor. Oh, and this was also an argument of the proprietors themselves against their rivals. So the Kennebec proprietors were very blunt and, you know, they're, they're, their chief operator said, well, we are doing this because it's for our interest and it will make us money. And they were very blunt about that and they didn't and care. Wrong. Oh, well, yeah, well, some of them made some money, yeah. But yeah, but they they did not give a rip about, you know, spreading religion or anything else. They just, they bribed, they did whatever they wanted. And so Belcher Noyes, who used to be a Kennebec proprietor as well, and wrote this very self-pitying account of that company saying how they kicked him out because he was, he held shares in their company and was working against them. And so they kicked him out. And he thought that was unfair um, and very ungentlemanly. Um, so, but anyway, which of so course it was, 
Oh, clearly, clearly. Very ungentlemanly. Very ungentlemanly. I mean, I've never encountered anybody in history who would be better described as a fuss budget than Belcher Noyes. <laughs> he was a literal fusser over budgets. Um, he, but so, but yeah, the point about this occupancy and they even mentioned, yes, we fence this land. And so for these people, if you fence land, if you cut down all the trees, yes, if you kill Wabanakis who get in the way of you claiming this, this inheritance, you know, this land of yours, it's yours. Uh, and the bluntest articulation of this statement, sadly, is not at the Maine Historical Society. It was in uh, the Maine, the Massachusetts Historical Society, where some guys, it uh, an agent of another company gets a letter in which uh, his agent says, uh, these people have told me that you bought the land for a few pumpkins, and these people who fought and died for it in the war aren't going to give it up to you, because uh, it's not really yours. And they threw a dollar in my face and said, good luck finding a jury that'll find in your favor in this, count in this county. Um, so Michael, this, these conflicts really expanded after the Seven Years' War and after the American Revolution because uh, for the many of the speculators, I suspect deep down, many of them maybe wished they would have kept Native American nations in power for longer. Uh, or uh, as as active uh, agents to resist colonization, because once the once Wabanaki military power and uh, was was broken, uh, many more of these colonists sort of flooded onto the frontier, feeling like they didn't need to worry anymore about being uh, being chased off of land they didn't belong by indigenous people. So they also didn't worry about needing protection from the land companies. But uh, there were sort of broader struggles in the early American Republic between the sort of Thomas Wilson's and then the, I guess, if you will, the Belcher noises. And what was the, the sort of context of that struggle? Yeah, so for, first, let me just kind of build a little bit on what, what Alice said. I mean, she, she's absolutely right that uh, a lot of these settlers have an idea that property is made by applying labor, including like military labor to the spot where you are. So property is a thing settlers make rather than a thing that governments sell. And of course the proprietor's response to that would be no, property is, it's fundamentally a legal thing. So, um, so it is a thing that governments make and sell through their, through their, their legislative powers. So to put, to put kind of a, um, a succinct summary on this, the dispute between the settlers and the proprietors is not just about who owns the land, but it's really fundamentally a dispute about how property is made, what the source of property is. Um, and you're absolutely right that this continues through the, um, through the American Revolution and into the early Republic. As for why the speculators hang on despite all the, the difficulty, honestly, a big part of the um, a big part of the reason has to do with ideas about population growth. Um, there's this very robust enlightenment kind of conversation around the Atlantic world during the 18th century. It really kind of picks up in the 1740s and 50s about how and why populations grow or shrink. And I can riff about this for far too long. I won't. The upshot for the speculators is that everything, all the conditions in North America seem to be in place for like a, an explosion of population, the likes of which none of them had ever seen. And so what's that, what that's going to translate to is increasing demand for land, rapidly increasing. So they're throwing around figures like the pop, the white population of British North America or then of the United States is going to double every 25 years. And then some people will come in and be like, no, I thought about it more. It's actually 15 years. So they're, they're really kind of continually convinced that demand for the lands that they claim and for legal title um, and therefore profit for themselves is imminent. It's just around the corner. If only they can hang on, if only they can kind of you know, get through their conflicts with squatters for a, for, for a few more years. Um, I think the one, the one last thing I'll say is that <clears throat> I, th I, think, I think I see the logic of your point, Ian, that um, some of them might have wished to, for indigenous power in the regions where they speculated to have lasted longer so as to set them up for you know, a cleaner slate for their sort of um, uh, speculative schemes. But on the other hand, settlers are, I mean, they're really important to the logic of land speculation because 
the, the question here is like, how do you, okay, so you've got a legal claim to land, but how do you actually make that into something that has value, something that people would want? Um, and the answer really does rely on land speculators convincing settlers to go there and build some semblance of a society, build some fences, plant some fields. Um, when I say some semblance of a society, I mean some semblance of what white, Americans of the colonial era or the early republic would have recognized as a society, right? Um, you know, plant a, plant a church, start a school, these kinds of things. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of incentive for land speculators to try and sort of turn the squatters on the land that they claim into legal settlers because doing so will then help them profit off the rest of the land that they retain. So there's there's kind of a there's kind of a tension there. And I think that's something that comes across in a lot of these sources is that the settlers, the squatters, as the proprietors would have called them, um, or the invaders as the, the proprietors might have called them, you know, they they this the settlers know that they have leverage over the speculators in order to help make these claims valuable. They're on the ground, they are felling the trees, they're building the fences. Sometimes um, they say so. They will say, we have made the land valuable. Um, and I'm glad you bring this up. I think it's a, a misconception among many people that the, the colonists were these sort of eager Daniel Boone types who wanted to blaze a trail into like uh, new adventurous uh, wilderness. And I'm, I'm not trying to make a value judgment. Obviously, this was not a wilderness. It was the Wabanakis managed uh, all of what was, was now Maine. And so it was not some sort of wild area. But the point being, most of these colonists didn't want to move to what they perceived to be a wilderness. They wanted to move to towns. They wanted to move to already thriving communities. And so in a weird way, they were at the same time, in some ways, sort of shock troops of empire. But also when you look at them talking among themselves, they're behaving like a bunch of penguins who are on the edge of the ice flow before they dive in where nobody wants to go first. And they're kind of, nobody wants to go first. And which is why companies like the Pajepska proprietors are offering sometimes giving away land to the first people who move there because nobody wants to move there because yeah, it might not be an acknowledged claim. And so maybe uh, maybe it turns out your town shouldn't be there and the Wabanakis are gonna burn it down and chase you out. Uh, maybe, uh, or maybe even if it's an acknowledged area, uh, there's not a school, there's not roads, uh, you know, it's miserable out there. And so nobody wants to be there. Can I, um, can I speak to that briefly? Please do. Yeah, because this is one of my absolute, like, this is this is one of my hobby horses. And I'll say that uh, what my absolute favorite thing from the entire Pajepska proprietor's paper is there is, um, in there somewhere, there's a list of, of, of lands that were uh, sold to, to settlers for Topsham, Topsham. And the title of the document is uh, List of Settlers for Topsham, Some of Whom Came. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Which I think really, really speaks to this because it's actually very difficult um, you know, I referred to this the other day, this perception that, you know, it's a, it's a nation of Daniel Boons who are just like, it have that itchy feet to go off into the wilderness as being like a nation of paws from Little House on the Prairie, uh, you know, where, where all of these, every sort of colonist um, is just being actively held back from exploding into the frontier when from what I've read, I mean, the opposite couldn't be more true. It requires an awful lot of cajoling to get, um, you know, there's always going to be one or two folks that are really interested in sort of being out there um, you know, breaking the land, building fences, you know, whatever, uh, paw stuff. But for, for most folks, you know, that's not, that's not a life that they're interested in. And it requires a lot of time, money, and effort and organization to actually get sort of a, a, a large sort of self-sustaining capacity of, of European settlers in, in, a, in a particular location, especially a location that has as poor agricultural prospects as, as most of Maine and Nova Scotia. Um, and the other thing I'll add about in terms of settlers is that I think this, this might be more of a niche um, Nova Scotia thing, but uh, for a lot of grants in the middle century, uh, if you didn't get a certain number of settlers in time, the crown would revoke your grant. Um, so, you know, in some places, the, the imperative to get settlers sort of goes beyond just this, you know, want to make it more attractive to others, but it's, it's, it's vital and baked into the very viability of your own claim. Sorry, I had to sneeze there. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, and so we're gonna get to the questions real quick. Two things, one, my favorite uh, 
apology, no, I'm not going letter was to the proprietors of North Yarmouth by a man, I can't remember his name, but he said, I was too quick in buying, uh, in buying a plot from you. Uh, my wife said, under no circumstances will we go uh, to this wild and dangerous frontier. Uh, can I have my money back, please? Um, and, but the, um, the other thing is, yeah, there's a struggle also in towns like Brunswick as well, which we see in the, the town book, where the actual frontier residents uh, tried to uh, take over control of the unclaimed land in their towns, the unallotted lands, to give or sell really cheap to anybody who would live there. And they would complain that the Boston-based speculators of wherever their town was didn't, weren't on the ground and didn't know what was going on. And they were holding out too long for people who were willing to pay more. And these people on the ground were saying, no, we need better land and we need to sell to people who will actually live here. Because until we get more people living here, this town is gonna be horrible and it won't be a real town. Um, and so you had uh, these town sort of councils, sometimes illegally operating as their own form of, 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 of proprietorships. Uh, which was illegal, um, and, and they would get into these these ongoing feuds with uh, with the the actual proprietors in places like Falmouth, but also Brunswick and elsewhere. Um, okay, uh, so um, first of all, uh, so we had a, a question um, uh, uh, asking about. Uh, uh, asking the uh, actually no we're going to go to the we'll start with the the Wharton uh, the Wharton deed uh, and so we have a question about uh, the the Wharton deed that has been referenced was a reaffirmation of the reality of Thomas Purchase's land claim that was recognized by Indians and English prior to the signing of the Wharton document uh, how does this factor into the panelists' perspectives um, and Tilly Lasky of our own staff has helpfully. Uh, added that the, there is a tandem document that includes, that accompany the Wharton deed that is the so-called Indian loyalty oath. Um, so would any panelists like to comment on uh, what uh, this, the, the Thomas Purchase land claim being reconfirmed or acknowledged, how, if that would have played any role in, uh, in, in shaping the sort of uh, indigenous uh, or English signing of the Wharton deed or how this, this affects what people, how people interpret the Wharton deed. Just as a guess, Ian, the, um, I, I don't know, I guess as a non-historian, I'm willing to guess on things. You guys seem like tied I mean, to I, documents. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, in uh, the, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, again, more from the Wabanaki perspective, this deed is, um, as a reaffirmation of a previous deed, you know, I think that that makes sense and that it's a, um, you know, it's like new, maybe some new people, maybe some, you know, I think that's like a typical kind of ongoing relationality part of the Wabanaki presumption of how relations uh, uh, in, in, in across lands uh, would happen. So I, I think that that made, that would make sense from a Wabanaki perspective. And I, and I, there's almost, it's almost written in that way too. Like, I, I feel like there's something about like, oh, there are all these other things. And of course they list all the resources, you know, all the different things, just so people are like, are we clear like where this is and all that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I think right. that that is, um, I think that's, yeah, very purposeful. If I can jump in here, I think so. Go I think it's it. really fascinating to think about how this how this deed could be. You know, the same document could mean such different things to different groups. On the one hand, like itself, one instance in a recurring cycle of you know acknowledgement and reacknowledgement and reciprocal obligations. And on the other hand, like the legalese in the deed is by and large, you know, um, pretty clear on well, pretty clear. I shouldn't say that. The, the, um, the emphasis in the legalese is on uh, an exclusive kind of, but then you get to the exception at the end, but first it's the, the emphasis is on an exclusive and heritable um, and permanent English claim. So that's kind of playing into the, the speculators hopes. I think a key to sort of understanding why speculators would, like what they read into this complex document 
um, has to do with sort of their anticipations about the future. So earlier at the beginning of the session, we were talking a lot about that kind of um, what I think Darren called the use and access sort of carve out at the bottom of the deed where, um, where the, the, the Wabanaki signatories are promised um, that they can continue improving our ancient planting grounds, they can continue hunting, they can continue fishing and fowling. And if English people are so attached to an idea of not just property, but exclusive private property, you might wonder like, why, why would they agree to that? I think the reason why has to do with their anticipations that over time, and probably not in the very distant future from when they signed this deed, the, the indigenous people that they were coming to this agreement with would you know, move elsewhere, that, that the settlement that English, that the English signatories plan to promote would itself force native people to move away. Um, and, then, and then that kind of use and access carve out at the end of the deed would be kind of you know, nugatory. That's a good point. And the, the deed, uh, so actually the document that's just above on the slideshow of the one that we're looking at right here is this petition from a lot of residents of Brunswick and Topsom in the 1730s that this in some ways a wonderful uh, follow up to this deed where essentially I, I clipped out some of the, uh, not physically, don't worry folks, but I, I, I uh, pasted some digital highlights together. Uh, and this in part, the, the residents of Brunswick were petitioning to keep a fort that had been built, uh, Fort George, confusingly not the same as Fort St. George's down the, down, down the way. Um, but what they complained about, they said, talking about the Wabanakis is that they view us uh, this place has been time without mine. They're talking about Brunswick. Has been time without mine. The the annual rendezvous of all the tribes that have been licentious and riotous, right? Um, and then they say uh, they uh, that their love can't be depended on as obvious to us conversant among them, meaning we speak with them, and who look upon us as unjust usurpers and intruders upon their rights and privileges and spoilers of their idle way of living from the English perspective, hunting and fishing and fowling instead of living in the same place all year round uh, and farming in one place was idle. They claim not only the wild beasts of the forest and fowls of the river, but or, uh, sorry, and fowls of the air, but also the fishes of the sea and rivers. And so with an eye look upon our salmon fishing, uh, with an ill eye look upon our salmon fishing and no doubt would disturb our fishers. So basically what they're complaining about is the Wapanakis are taking the 1684 Wharton deed seriously and saying, hey, we have a right to be here. Uh, and the residents of Brunswick are complaining about that and saying we need a fort to protect us from these people, uh, which is, I would argue, another, uh, another great way that these kind of documents, uh, often uh, uh, oppositional, written by colonizers can be really valuable insights uh, into sometimes the sort of indigenous perspective on you know resource use, land rights, etc. And so we have here this deed and uh, this document from the 1730s, making it clear the Wabanakis were uh, very much well aware of what they had signed in this case and what had been agreed to. Uh, and from their perspective, uh, it was the uh, it was the colonists who were potentially uh, sullying that agreement. Yeah. Um, and if I can jump in here, actually, when I was rereading this, I was like, oh, this is great. Why haven't I seen this before? And then I realized I'd actually extensively quoted it in my own dissertation, um, <laughs> which is always fun. But uh, so I did go back to that and look at what I had said. Um, and just to, because the thing that really uh, strikes me about this, in addition to the clear, like, um, indication that Indigenous folks, you know, have not left, they are there, they are doing the things that they said that they were going to be doing, which is still using this area. Um, to kind of speak to Michael's point a little bit about an assumption that they would leave, um, you know, the proprietors of Brunswick were perfectly well aware that this was an important site of, of Native um, activity and rendezvous. Um, and in fact, the fact of that, they, they highlight that in when they petitioned the general court uh, for the you know, founding of Brunswick in the first place. So I just pulled it as they, as they say that a strong settlement at Brunswick um, is going to great quote greatly tend to dislodge the Indians from their principal fishery, keep them from chief carrying places, and possibly be a means of removing them further from us if a war should happen. So the, the, what they were doing at Brunswick was, um, you know, not only not in ignorance of 
indigenous use of this area, but actually directly meant to counter and exclude in some ways um, indigenous usage of this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, oh, where was I going with this? Uh, sorry, uh, yes. Um, I just derailed my own train of thought, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and while you're, while you're thinking, I just wanted to jump in on one small point please. on this. I think, um, I think maybe a helpful contrast to draw as we're thinking about these deeds that's been implicit in our conversation is um, this future looking perspective versus a perspective that's firmly rooted in the in the present world of this 1684 moment. And so um, at the moments when the Wabanaki are um, signing and negotiating these, um, these deeds, um, the number of um, English settlers there is is relatively small. They are absolutely struggling. They are, you know, bumbling to get this settlement going. And so, um, the there isn't a full anticipation of the threat that these settlements will become later later on. And whereas, as Michael has said, um, you know, this utterly optimistic vision on the English colonist side does. Um, in some ways come to fruition in, in ways that the Wabanaki did not anticipate. That's a really good point. Um, and uh, the last thing I was just gonna say is this, what seems to be almost a throwaway line, but I think is not, uh, is when it says, those of us obvious to us conversant among them. And so one of the things that, uh, so there are some things in the documents that we rarely learn about. You know, One of the things as I think Sarah is intimately aware of is right, finding women who are often legally invisible in, in documents uh, across the board genre wise. And there's all kinds of other people, the enslaved servants, uh, all kinds of poor and, and sort of marginal living people uh, in various communities who we rarely get a glimpse of unless they break the law or you know die in a particular place or what have you. But so another thing that's rarely legally visible here is ordinary interactions between indigenous people and ordinary non-literate colonists who we sometimes see it when people get uh, drawn up for selling illegally booze or other stuff to Native Americans. Uh, or there's these throwaway lines about those of us conversant among them, or, oh, there were some, they'll say there were some Indians who stayed the night at such and such person's house, and then they witnessed this crime or whatever. But there's ordinary interactions between individuals and groups of Wabanakis and colonists all throughout this period of time. Um, and sometimes it's friendly, sometimes not, but it's important to note that these, the wars that break out are not wars between strangers. These are not nameless, faceless groups of people killing each other. It's people who know each other's names and they're sometimes settling scores and grudges or, or yelling you know, uh, terms of, of, of surrender or bargaining or, or whatever. Uh, and so it's, I think uh, oftentimes that gets lost because so many of these individuals did not leave any written evidence of their interactions uh, for the, the sort of literate observers like Belcher Noise to record because oftentimes because they were actively hiding from them. Okay. I think uh, just to answer uh, Sarah and mm -hmm. really to cite your, your book again, Ian, um, uh, I mean, I think post, yeah, after, King Philip's War, the, the Medicom, you know, and then, you know, it's very clear. Uh, the Wabanaki folks see that as a really important turning point, uh, you know, in such a way. So, you know, thinking about the next 50 years, uh, next 70 years or whatever, like the containment, military containment by Wabanaki people uh, of, of the frontier. I mean, right. So I think that's, I think that is done out of, just to push back a little bit, Sarah, this anticipation that they're gonna to try to turn Maine into Massachusetts or, you know, the district of Maine, you know, I guess at that point or whatever it's yeah. called um, from the English, like that there is a real sense that, um, um, and I think, you know, so many things happen in that second half of the 17th century. And I, it's like hard to really summarize, but I think there's a little bit of this like anticipatory kind of, you know, containment strategy, first militarily, uh, and then through diplomacies of, of various forms um, um, as well. And, and that, you know, uh, 
where, uh, you know, if you look at even the treaty records, you know, like, you know, where a fort is placed is very important to Wabanaki leaders, right? Like things like that are very like, well, why are they arguing like it's this place, you know, and not three miles away or what? It, like, these are really strategically like, okay, they're going to get a fort. Clearly, they're going to try to get a fort, but we're going to tell them put it over here and not over there. Like that, that, that the so much time in the treaty record is spent on that shows you this really deliberate containment piece as, as the military piece starts to fade away, right, in the early 18th century. So, so I guess, you know, I just want to reiterate that in terms of the agency. And then the other thing in terms of we, I mean, we haven't quite gotten to it. It's been hinted at a couple of times uh, by folks is, is this, you know, the role of Wabanaki women um, in not only sort of setting up and, 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 and framing the, you know, a really different uh, engagement around political decision-making and, 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 and land relations and, and, and powerful forms of control. Um, in the, and then you see this manifest even into the 19th century, uh, Michael Pauling, who's on the Call has a great American Indian Quarterly um, article about you know Penobscot women ha having control over property in the 19th century in a way that that um, that uh, Euro American women don't have you know like that they're actually controlling properties in a way that you know so I think that that iteration in terms of leadership management of the property uh, my grad student Joe talked about you know different land use patterns make. English people not good neighbors as well. The, the sort of emphasis on animal cult, you know, and, and monoculture, uh, uh, you know, all these things that make the English very bad neighbors just ecologically. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I guess I just pushed, you know, <laughs> those, those things all happening together um, make for a very, you know, important kind of reframing of the anticipation, anticipation uh, of what's coming next uh, for sure. I think just to, to highlight um, something, thank you for that addition. Um, and I absolutely agree about, you know, the importance of King Philip's War um, as a turning point. And, and I think part of what we're seeing here and what's fun about this forum as we sort of work through this live is, um, right, the question of, of periodization and what other events we're using to contextualize a document. And so if we put King Philip's War um, in conversation with the events of the 1680s, will they we read the documents in a certain way. Um, in contrast, if we read the 1680s um, and say the 1770s together, we're going to see um, see different things, and and I think that's fascinating. And then for the for Maine, you could argue that the 1720s are really key, and uh, we're coming up on the tricentennial of both that war and then the uh, the named Dummer's Treaty, which hopefully we will have uh, some good. Uh, programming on that in the in the near future that could be its own thing uh, but you're absolutely right I'm glad you brought up periodization Sarah thank you uh, I'm gonna try and tie in uh, somebody's question into sort of final thoughts but I guess last thing when thinking about diversity we should also note that the Wabanakis themselves the different Wabanaki nations did not all interpret the same deeds or treaties the same they were a confederacy they tried to uh, I received some, I think, justified criticism in my book for sometimes uh, saying Wabanaki when I really should have said Penobscot. And so you look, the Penobscots in particular were pretty consistent with their interpretations of various boundaries uh, throughout to a degree that uh, some, other, some other groups farther to the south and west sometimes were not because these, these communities uh, were forcibly broken up or, or became refugees and relocated and scattered to different communities. But so sometimes you'll get different indigenous interpretations of, of the same agreement based on whether they were Penobscot or Amariskagan or, uh, or living at St. Francis or, or something else. And even sometimes members of these own communities had different approaches to what they thought would be the best uh, interpretation or, or strategy to take when dealing with, with Massachusetts and responding to these. And so even, you know, there's not always just going to be, oh, what is the Wabanaki, you know, singular interpretation of a given thing? That's really unfair to expect, uh, just as with any other, uh, any other community. There were, there were factions as with everybody else. Uh, so the, um, I suppose, so uh, Jim St. Pierre asked us, uh, placing 
Uh, he said that the, the Pajewska proprietors were a product of their era, which is true, but I would argue that is used. That says everything and nothing about anybody. Everybody's a product of their era. Oftentimes people say somebody's a usually a man of their time when they're about to say, so therefore we should say nice things about this person who did stuff that I don't like. Um, but uh, yes, they were uh, and ask how, uh, rather than assessing whether the proprietors were good guys or bad guys, which I would argue is too a kind of uh, meaning what, uh, looking at the actual role of the Pajepska proprietors in the uh, colonization of, uh, of the main uh, Wabanaki frontier. Uh, if you were going to, uh, Thinking, thinking about the role of companies like the Pajabska proprietors in the, in the history of Maine uh, and then the broader uh, American Northeast. Uh, what kind of perspective would you, would you argue uh, would change? What narrative of history of this broader region would change if we take seriously the actions and role of the Pajabska proprietors. If we were to teach and foreground the actions of this, this group of speculators, right? How would that change the narrative of the history of sort of New England as well as the Canadian Maritimes in terms of you know, how, it's, how it's taught and how people think about it? Um, well, just to, to kind of like jump in and get started on this, um, I'm thinking about uh, Darren, you, when you were introducing yourself, you kind of had a, a throwaway line about sort of whether the Pajeps proprietors succeeded or failed, they impacted uh, main history. And, and the way that I often think about um, land companies uh, sort of on both sides of the modern US-Canada border is that they kind of, um, they failed their way to success uh, in a sense, where by, whether or not they sort of were actually directly responsible for the creation of what we now know of, of Maine and the various different settler communities uh, throughout the region, um, by kind of persisting and existing and like uh, creating by simply being there a precedent of ownership um, and of European action uh, and of land ownership and title in the region, they sort of made themselves into the anchor for later uh, more enforceable claims, um, which is to say, you know, uh, even if you don't get a single settler, the fact you can say there's a town called Topsham, the fact you can say there's a town called Brunswick, even in an alternative reality where those failed miserably, that can become proof of a town called Brunswick and it creates a narrative of sort of un unbroken settlement and expansion um, and creation. Great, thanks. Uh, anybody else? What do we? What changes about the narrative of history if we, if we, when we talk about it and we include the Pajewska proprietors as sort of uh, as major players? I mean, I can. If I, I can always say more. I can always say more. Of course, well, I'm thinking, oh. of course, but yeah, thinking as everybody, even if not necessarily in your own scholarship, but even as teachers, right, when we're, uh, all of you are involved in various ways in, in, in public education. Um, and so this is my version of the so what question, uh, yeah. but I'm trying to think about it broadly. So like, yeah, if uh, not that you're going to teach in schools and say, all right, children, you need to learn all of the proprietor's names and you need Don't to speak for yourself, Ian. That's fair. Uh, you know, we need to, uh, here's a picture of the Pajapska proprietors playing cards, color it in and, you know, talk about their, but you know, if we're taking them seriously, like, all right, here's the history of this region and here's the Pajapska proprietors. They're one of the, the groups that we learn about as being, you know, a, a relevant yeah, yeah. players. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, go ahead, Darren. Um, yeah, I think the less, I mean, the way, you know, again, more from a indigenous studies, native studies, uh, perspective I think you know it, it's 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 interesting and it's the universal elements of it meaning um, land speculation by these by these companies uh, with with the full support of uh, the colonial you know endeavor um, um, and then the tension that creates with the eventual the eventual sort of settlers themselves right? Um, it is kind of a universal, uh, but also in this particular moment where 
the, the land property um, state making relationships are starting to transform in particular ways. It, it's, it's also very instructive to be like, you know, at some point, the rebellion against the kind of landed elite by the people actually settling and sort of what that means for the broader history of, of Maine, you know, from an indigenous perspective, both of those are pretty bad um, because the first one works out uh, of the doctrine of discovery, the thing that we've been talking about, the sort of, we can't ever really own land in the eyes of the European Christian folks uh, on the one hand. And then um, how this leads to um, a, vi on the one hand, a violence uh, on the frontier by settlers against native people and, and interests. Um, and, and on the other hand, eventually, and I mentioned this before, they dress up as Indians when they want to go fight against the landed elite. I mean, that the, the ironies of like uh, otherness that, that it takes for people to like naturalize that story of like, hey, why did they dress up like Indians? The, the people that they were, you know, oftentimes violently also going against to be violent, uh, to dress up as to be violent against the their land their land holding overlords. I mean, this is a very interesting kind of space to think about mascotry, to think about any number of things that are related to the abjectness of otherness that is created in in frontier spaces across North America. This is repeated. Um, many, many times. Thanks, that's a good point. Uh, Michael, go for it. Yeah, so I'd, I'd agree entirely with all of that. And I guess, I, um, uh, I guess I'll just echo it in, 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 sl in slightly different words. Um, while, while tagging back onto the, um, the, 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 the member of the audience's comment about um, the fact that the Pajepscot proprietors were men of their time. I mean, there is something kind of evocative about that phrase. And for me, what it evokes is like a, a question, which is, okay, what, what was their time? What defined their time? And I think when you, um, when you spend time combing through an archive like the Pajep Scott proprietor's papers, what comes across primarily is that this was a time that was defined by a, a, a contest between different groups of Europeans and Euro-Americans over who would primarily benefit from the process of native dispossession and that this consumed these people's time, it filled their dreams, it was the source of their ambitions. So yes, they were men of their time. And then the next step is to think about what, what that time was. Oh, that was really good. Uh, Sarah, we haven't heard from you yet, so you can, you can follow that, go ahead. So I think this is just um, saying in different words um, some of the points that we've been making throughout this session, but I think um, one of the things that emerges very clearly from centering the Pajepscot proprietors is um, the intertwining of um, state and non-state actors, if we want to use that term, or um, of economic elites and, and the state and that you know, particularly, you know, Ian, as you so nicely set out at the beginning, um, that these groups are really, you know, they're inseparable, they're one in the same. And so, and the, you know, the question of how much is it state involvement versus um, not the state, I think that that misses a lot of the nuances that are captured really nicely in, in this collection. And um, I think the other thing that, um, emerges maybe not from the collection writ large, but from every single document we've looked at, right, is the um, multiple voices and multiple actors. And I think that's telling not just about this collection, but about documents from this period as a whole, that um, even as we're looking at documents um, produced by people in power to center the experiences of people in power, um, we can always dig more deeply and um, reveal other stories within them. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the great things about collections like this one coming online is that um, the public as well as um, historians sitting in archives are able to do that work and see those nuances. Absolutely. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, yeah, and hopefully uh, when this document or when this collection is open to the public, uh, people who are involved even in, in secondary education and, and younger will find, you know, uh, relevant ones for their, uh, for their appropriate classroom settings. Uh, 
to sort of obliquely refer to one question. My, my personal favorite, I think one of my favorites from this collection is that petition from the, from the town of Brunswick about the fort because it is so evocative in so many ways, however unintentionally often, but that's so many, so many of the, we, the stuff we learn from these documents are you know, unintentional tells uh, that, 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 uh, that writers will, will give to us. Um, Al, I know you were, you looked like you were gearing up to, to say something if you wanted to, uh, to, to give us our, a final thought about your thoughts on the, including speculators in the narrative or the, the, the company. Yeah, sure. Like I said, I, I do always literally have more things to say. So that's, here I am. Um, but I was just, you know, one of the things that you really get out of collections of papers like the Pajapsuk Priorish papers, and I, I'm so incredibly pleased um, that they're, is now an initiative and money and funding to digitize these records because they're a tremendously, tremendously valuable um, for understanding this period. So I'm so excited about that and I'm so pleased to help promote that in some small way. Um, but what you really get, or at least what I get when I read papers like this is you see the messiness and the work and the dare I say contingency of European expansion um, into these spaces, you know, just how like the amount of effort and labor and money that gets spent to transport uh, the the um, settlers to these frontier spaces when oftentimes it, it becomes very easy to think about if we want to call it settler colonialism, if we want to call it European expansion as this very kind of naturalistic process of uh, violent white settlers spreading into the frontiers, fighting with indigenous people, expropriating indigenous people's land and sort of continuing on when in fact it's, it's, um, it's there's nothing natural about that process. It required a lot of people in a lot of pl high places to put a lot of effort into promoting that in order for it to play out the ways that it did. And that, that's one of the main things that I get um, when I read a collection like the Pajepska Proprietor's Papers. Great, thanks. And at least for me, uh, it definitely focusing on the sort of the middlemen of empire, if you will, for so long, you know, speculation is as American as apple pie in that it was imported by European colonizers and then became wildly popular over here uh, and became modified in various ways. Uh, and, you know, there's obviously it changes and I, you know, uh, I'm usually skeptical of, uh, of arguments that, you know, the, the process of empire didn't change uh, uh, at all between the 17th century and the 19th century, but there was definitely this sort of common thread running through it all. Um, and the companies like the Pajewska proprietors played a, a a, an important role in it all the way through it. And that it wasn't, yeah, these band of, you know, uh, intrepid Daniel Boone types uh, going out to do the work of empire on their own. They were bankrolled and they were encouraged and coordinated by these companies who often, and of course, who also were very interested in, as they frankly said, the empire is not doing its job unless we profit from it. We meaning the members of that company. Um, okay. So uh, I'm mindful of being uh, uh, running over time on our, our Saturday. I'd like to thank everybody uh, in attendance. Uh, the historians forums, we, uh, we try and bring together cutting edge scholarship uh, to the general public in an accessible format. Uh, that's been the goal and hopefully you, you feel that we've done it. Um, uh, as a reminder, it, you'll be able to see this, uh, a recording of this to play back to enjoy again and again for all your friends and family when it's recorded in a couple weeks. Uh, if you are not yet a member of the Maine Historical Society, uh, you should definitely become one. Um, and then uh, check out the museum and all the exhibits and then the, the library back when it is, uh, when it is open. Uh, thanks again to all of our, uh, of our participants and all of you in the audience for making this possible and our partners throughout Maine uh, and the broader, uh, the world even for who knows where people are, are all listening into. Uh, thanks again uh, to everybody. Hopefully we will see you all back here again soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you again so much. Please check out my chat. Oh, yes, by all <laughs> means, do so. Those. Yes, uh, uh, Donald discussing. Loring, yes. Penobscot elder and leader who's written about these issues. Thank you so much for sharing that, Darren. The link, the, the link is there in the chat. Darren also gave a great talk just last week uh, about uh, some of these issues as well. Uh, those of you, uh, sorry panelists that we didn't get to all of the documents. Uh, I was, they're just so rich. There's just, you know, 
uh, almost as soon as we started, I knew like, oh man, this whole, the whole game plan is going to be going to have to, you know, be modified here because there's just so much good stuff. Um, and so, uh, but thank you all for, for rolling with the flow.